Okay, guys, we'll get started here in just a minute or so. Um, again, if you're just joining us, please put over in the chat section uh, who you are and where you're from. Uh, for those of you that have joined and, and got on, welcome uh, to the webinar today. Um, it's going to be over strategic territorial planning, um, which I think uh, is going to be a pretty big eye opener for, for people, um, especially sales reps when they get on. Uh, one of the biggest complaints you know, that Sean and I get is, you know, well, it's just you have such large territories and geographic areas to cover is how in the world do you attack it? Um, and we're going to get in depth on that uh, quantity versus quality time management um, and just ways to be more effective to where you feel like you're making a difference. So. So, Sean, when you're ready, I'll let you introduce everything and then I'll get started. Yeah, let me know when you're ready. We're recording, so ready to go. Okay. So guys, my name is Eddie Green. Um, I'm the VP of sales for tier level digital marketing. Um, and also to have a pretty big background in commercial sales uh, for franchise system um, in disaster restoration. So, and I'm gonna let Sean introduce himself and then we'll get started. I'm Sean Lewis. I'm the founder of tier level digital marketing. Um, and me and Eddie are both uh, very passionate about the restoration industry. Um, we helped uh, grow a franchise um, from three to over 14 million in just a few years by building a very successful business development team. And what we're gonna talk about today, strategic territorial planning is the foundation of how we built that, how we build a team and how we um, you know, incorporated that mission to get to where we were and it wasn't, it, it wasn't on accident. It was a lot of hard work and a lot of focus and a lot of organization. And, you know, we're going to touch on a little bit of that today. And, and I'm sure many of you will have follow up and things like that. So um, we're very excited to talk about this today. And Eddie, I'm going to go ahead and let you get started. All right. Fantastic. Well, guys, I, I live and you're going to hear for those of you that follow either Sean or, or my, my podcast, you're going to hear that we live by several mantras. Um, execution of little things to make you great, out care, out educate, out sell. Um, but um, another big one, um, being smart, hungry, and humble. But another big one um, that I believe in is that a failure to plan is a plan to fail. Um, and, you know, Sean and I are blessed to be able to go out and consult with a lot of uh, restoration companies across the United States. And the biggest problem that we see is, is really the ways to attack um, and be strategic, large geographical areas and territories. You know, if you're, we'll just take, you know, Denver, for example. Um, you know, if you're in Denver, Colorado, and there's only one or two of you out with boots on the ground and you have big local presence there um, from competitors, people that are independent, um, they're not restricted by territorial boundaries, they have better marketing budgets, um, those kinds of things. How in the world can you beat these guys? Um, how do you feel like that every time you, why do you feel like that every time you turn around, you're seeing the competitors on jobs and you're thinking, man, I just thought about stopping in there last week. If I would have stopped in there last week, maybe that would have been our job. And what ends up happening is you end up being managed by the whirlwind. You, and so instead of you managing the whirlwind, you let it run you. And it's easy to do. And I'm victim of this myself. Um, I didn't have a massive geographical territory, but it was enough commercial presence that I just felt overwhelmed. Um, I felt like I couldn't make a difference, that I was running here to there and then all over the place and being stretched in five million different directions, trying to see whether or not I was going to um, be able to be successful. And it was very frustrating for me. And one of the people that is a good friend of mine and somebody that I consider a mentor. Um, we were at a, at a surfer retreat and he said, um, he basically said, um, you know, I, the old adage, how do you eat an elephant, Eddie? And I said, well, you eat an elephant one bite at a time. He said, but you're, you're forgetting the most important factor um, of that adage. He said that people never talk about, which is that you eat an elephant one bite at a time, but you have to remember to chew because if you don't chew that bite, you're going to choke. So what does that mean? How does that translate? You see this down at the bottom to where it says 
two plus two plus one equals success. That is going to be your foundation. That is going to, uh, for success in your territory. And we're going to get into that a little bit. So the first thing is, is that um, whenever you look, um, the problems that you incur are typically with most franchises, you're going to have one to two sales reps in a geographical area that are going to have to be responsible for a very large territory. Um, number two, as we talked about, is competition. We all know that there are a lot of choices when it comes to disaster restoration. You may be walking in, you may be residentially centric and you're walking into agents and you're hearing, well, we work with Abbott's or we work with uh, 911 restoration or we work with Mellon's or we work with, you know, Burgraff, you know, some big large or Trilink, some big large independent um, company that they like to use. Um, or they may be using another big box company. But competition is always going to be a huge problem. And how do you feel like you can get a leg up on these guys? Number three is going to be organizations. And we're going to spend some time talking about organizational involvement. Um, you know, you're, you may be part, let's just say you're affiliated with BOMA and you go in there and there's seven disaster restoration companies or your apartment association. There's seven disaster restoration companies in there and the big independent is pulled the trigger on the platinum sponsorship and you just don't feel like you can make a dent in there. I'm going to show you strategic, critical thinking ways around on how you can deepen relationships and organizations and outlast your competition. Number uh, four is maybe you guys are on dedicated route systems. Um, for those of you that have ever heard me speak, um, and I am very staunch with owners um, about routes that any tried and true sales professional do not stick them on a route system. In essence, the way you plan your day is going to, in essence, be a route. Okay. But having them going, putting them on a dedicated route system is handcuffing them. It breeds quality or quantity over quality of contacts because they become more concerned about the number of people they're touching versus the quality of conversation. Um, so we're going to get a little bit into that. And then the whirlwind, as you develop more and more relationships, you have more opportunity for loss. And so you may have this great day planned out and then somebody throws a monkey wrench in it. Um, and what I see more often than not is that I will see sales reps go out and they'll have this great plan for the day, get the first couple, three contacts under their belt, they get a call from a client, and then they'll spend the next two days on that loss whenever it's not necessary. Remember that if you have plan A for your day, you can always come back to plan A. So you go out, make sure the client's stable, trust production to do their job, and get back to plan A and pick up where you left off. So again, a failure to plan is a plan to fail, and we're going to talk about that. So Sean, do you want to expand on any of that before we go forward? Yeah, no, I absolutely agree. And um, I'm going to put another poll up in a second, but just to kind of re revisit the poll from the beginning, and I know that kind of chops up a little bit, but, you know, how many contacts do you visit a day? I mean, most of you said one to five. Now, if those are quality, meaningful appointments. It's a very good number to be in. Um, and then it kind of spreads out between six and 10 and then 20 or more. I will say if you're visiting 20 or more and you're doing a traditional route, you might really want to go back and look at your numbers. You want to look at, are you being effective, you know, just dropping in and talking to that many people per day. Some people have had success with it. Um, but, you know, I've seen over and over again, you know, the habit of route sales and a lot of sales reps don't even realize they're not even calling on actual insurance agencies or contacts that even make a decision for restoration type need. Uh, point in blank, uh, I had a, I was doing some consulting when I was at Serve Pro Corporate years ago, and I was on site with an owner, and, and they were telling me the story about, oh, no, I was actually out with a rep, and we went into an office, and it was on her route sheet, and we walked in, and she said, yeah, so-and-so used to work here, such a sweet lady, blah, 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 and you know, she came here every day, every month for the last five years. Turns out it was an auto insurance provider only. They didn't even write homeowner policies, anything. And, and it was just like, there was no strategic planning there. No mindset of, oh, are these doors I'm opening even a viable candidate for somebody that we would do work with? And she was constantly handing out calendars and candy and all that other junk. And, and it just, it, it was a waste of time. It was a waste of resources. And, and that's why you really have to focus on creating targets and executing on those targets versus 
um, just doing a route because somebody told you to. Yeah, I can't agree more, you know, and I see a lot of people, you know, that I'll go out with and do ride widths in the field and watch them spend, you know, which I, I do believe in a force through the trees mentality and that success can be one relationship away, but really watch them spend the majority of time that they should be spending with the COI presenting to the wrong person, you know, and this impacts your time management. You know, if that person can't write the million dollar check, yeah, you can give them some 30,000 foot view so that they feel warm and fuzzy about giving you a handoff to the correct COI. But I watch them put all their eggs in this basket, uh, presenting to the wrong person and then walk out and say, oh, I've got that relationship locked up you know, and knowing full well that that person can't make a decision at all. And we'll talk about that um, in the documentation side and the pre-call planning and the steps that you're doing to ensure your success. So we do have our second poll up, um, which is how do you organize your week? Um, are you using a written planner, a digital planner, a calendar on the phone, a CRM tool? Um, I think you should be using all of the above, um, to be real honest with you um, in that. But, you know, what's your primary? Uh, Sean and I are big advocates of the Clever Fox Planner. Um, it's a planner that is a, a productivity and efficiency tracker. Um, really incredible. Uh, I encourage you guys to go do some research on it. Um, and then the, your digital planner, you know, I've got one of those on my phone. I, I, I'm victim of not using my calendar as much as I should, uh, but a big advocate of CRM tools um, because, and we'll talk about that in the documentation. So the next slide that I'd went to is talking about my top 10. Um, I'd be interested to know um, if you guys want to put it over in the chat panel. Um, how many of you guys actively work off of a written top 10 and a written top 25 wish list? Um, I'm a huge advocate of this um, because it keeps my goals in front of me um, as, uh, with that have people that I actively know. So my top 10 are people that I know I can do business with right now. Um, I know just because I've known them in the past, my reputation through relationship cultivation, that I can really do business with these top 10. This top 10 should evolve. Um, there should, it should rotate. There will be people that will come in and off of that top 10 list uh, based upon how things go. And then you should also create a top 25 target wish list. These are the biggest relationships are the biggest feathers in your cap, so to speak, that you really want. Um, and that list will rotate too. As you cultivate those relationships, they may bounce into your top 10 or they may just fall over into your relationship list. But this should be something that I encourage you to look at every quarter for a couple of reasons. Um, one is it keeps you actively engaged in who you're going after um, and who what relationships you're landing but it also gives you a very real world perspective of maybe you're not the right fit um, for somebody in that top 25 maybe you are in your top 25 uh, wish list maybe you need to hand that over to your colleague um, you've tried for six months to crack that nut. Um, now, don't get me wrong. There's been people that I've worked on for three or four years that I finally landed their relationship. But, you know, you know the people that you're working a lot better than anyone else. And if you don't feel like you're a good fit for them, migrate that over to your colleague. Do some trading um, with that and see, because ultimately it's the owner's relationship. It is the relationship of your restoration company. It is not your personal relationship, so to speak. So you want to do whatever's going to make that successful. Um, but I encourage you guys to sit down and have that top 10, top 25 wish list and make sure that you're revisiting that every quarter and revamping it and doing that. Sean used it as part of his hiring process. Um, and I wanted to uh, let him elaborate as to the why and what the benefit of that was. Sean. Yeah, sorry uh, about the um, sorry about that. I was just getting another call, buddy. Um, yeah, yeah, the top ten, the top twenty-five list. Yeah, just uh, if you want to talk, tell them what your methodology was for like a candidate coming in with a top ten list. Yeah, absolutely. So when we hired our commercial business development reps or specialists, uh, we were very intentional on in the interview process. We would ask them. Um, you know, create a list, 10, 25, however many you want to put on there of, of people that you can get me as the director of business development or the owner of this business in front of in the next 30, 60 days. 
Now, what that did was uh, it created for a follow-up interview where we could look over that list, ask questions about how they know those people or how they have a relationship with them. And then when you hire them, you actually use that list as an accountability and a target list for the next 30, 60, 90 days. And what I love about doing this is if you have that list and you go out with them the first week on the job, they're learning about restoration from the experienced owner or manager, but they're also you know, you're really going to see, if, are they bluff? Are they just a, a BS talker, a smooth talker? And it's very important because a lot of salespeople bullshit their way into a position. And it's very important to kind of alleviate that so you're not stuck with them for three, six, nine months. And then you're like, wow, this person's not performing and the numbers are horrible. And I'm going to pull up in a second. That's what I was writing just a second ago. I want to I see how many of you actually know your numbers. How much have you sold in the first quarter of this year? So I'm going to put that up in just a second. But I think it's very important that you, um, you, you have that list. If you don't have one, many of you are saying you do have one. Um, I ask that question a lot. And sometimes when I ask for it, they're like, well, it's in my head. And that, that's not good enough. You've got to write it down. You've got to have it in front of you. You've got to put it up on your wall in your office or your car or somewhere. You've got to be reminded of who those targets are and what is your follow-up. Are you putting notes about those people? Are you not getting any momentum? Are you not doing emergency uh, planning protocols with them? Are you getting involved with them? What are you doing to learn more about their business? If you're not doing that, then it's a problem. It's great to have a list. If you're not executing on that list, it's another problem as well. Right. You know, and the one thing about it, too, is that I would see people that would have, you know, top 10 lists are really going to start off, especially if you're newer. It gives you a good starting point. But number two, uh, so that you're not jumping into a territory cold. But number two is that it's amazing to me that people that they have relationships with, these are people I know I could do business with, that they don't touch them. You know, and, you know, relationships thrive on communication. So I would go do an audit. Um, on the CRM tool only to find out, you know, they hadn't even visited anybody in their top 10. You know, it's like, well, that makes no sense to me. How can they be your top 10 and, and you're not, you're not actively pursuing that relationship, cultivating that relationship? You know, so A, it's a good starting point. B, is it keeps you busy um, to be able to do that. So let's talk about the two plus two plus one um, equals success. So here's where we're going to get into the meat um, of, of what we have going on about how to attack a territory, um, to break it down to where it is an attainable goal for you to where you feel like you're making a difference. So we're going to start with those of you that are commercially centric. Um, if you are trying to cultivate your job was high, you were hired to be more of a commercially um, centered representative then I would allocate two days of your week to whale hunting. These are going to be the biggest relationships that you want to cultivate. They could be the property management companies, the event centers, the apartment associates, you know, the, the big apartment companies, the, the hoteliers, you know, whoever. But two days a week, you're going to dedicate to going after the biggest relationships you can get. Then you're going to take two days and you're going to section off approximately a one to two square mile radius and you're going to touch every business, every agent in that territory right there in that little sector until that is completed. And then you're going to move on to the next one. And then of course, never forsake your residential, never forsake your agents because residential does happen more frequently than commercial. And this is a good pad for you. So take one day to dedicate to your agents. Now, why are we doing this? For one, you're going to have a plan. OK, that is going to make you feel like that you are more effective and making a difference and making an impact in your territory. OK, number two is that here is here is the scenario that I see more often than not. I'll go out in my consulting, which is a three day boot camp. And the first day is classroom. And then I'm going to go out with the sales reps um, for days two and three. And I say, I want to do, if I'm spending a half day with a rep, let's touch six accounts, um, six potential targets um, before lunch, before I go to the next rep. So I will see the rep go. We'll go to, to stop A, which none of these are scheduled appointments. This is all quote unquote cold calling. And they will walk into point A and then we will walk out of that building and get in the car and drive 15 minutes, 20 minutes across town to go um, see the next, to go see their next stop, which again is not a scheduled appointment. But when they walked out of point A, there were 50 opportunities staring them right in the face. They literally could have spent the entire week right there around point A, and they didn't. 
So the time management was awful because they wasted 20 minutes to go to an unscheduled appointment across town. Now that's great if you're whale hunting and that's the intent, but more often than not, they didn't have that type of thought process or strategic planning when they were going out to take me out to go do this. It's just the way they spend their day. So you could err to one of two things on that one to five contacts a day. You're spending more windshield time than you are active engaged time with a potential COI, or um, you are spending one to two hours a day in engaging conversations, which is why you're only getting one to five contacts a day. I would err more towards the first one, that you're spending more windshield time than you are active communication time. The best way to track that is to write your time in the facility and write your time out of the facility. And if you will do this for a week, I would be willing to bet that you spend less than two to three active hours per day engaged in conversation with the client. And that's if for an owner standpoint, if I'm, that's all the productivity I'm getting out of representatives, that's all I want to pay them for. You know, I'm going to pay you for the two to three hours that you spent. So be strategic. Um, if you're residentially centric, just switch it up. Two days of agents, two days of one to two square mile saturation, one day of commercial. It's because you always want to have commercial. Commercial losses are bigger and there's less uh, emotion involved and they're easier. Um, so, you know, but if you're residentially centric, just switch it up. I have used this um, in territories all over the country and had tremendous amounts of success in feeling like I wasn't overwhelmed and the reps weren't overwhelmed and being able to attack their territories. Um, but Sean had posted a deal about your numbers too. Make sure that you not only know this is how much that I've sold for the quarter, but this was my no job percentage. This was my chase close percentage. This I had this many commercial jobs, this many residential jobs. Um, you know, track it all the way down so that whenever people ask for your numbers, you can just throw them up all over the place. So let's talk about organizations. Um, organizations, in my opinion, are probably some of the biggest strategy that you can employ. Everybody that I talk to is involved in either BNI, BOMA, you know, things like that. And guess what? So is everyone else. Everyone else is involved in it. Now, I'm not saying you forsake those, but I'm saying that you have to be strategic in where you're going to spend your money and devote the majority of your time. If you walk into a BOMA and there are six platinum sponsors and all six platinum sponsors are restoration companies, don't pull the trigger on a platinum sponsorship there. Go to the lunches. Get out of it what you can, but don't go all in there. Go find something that you like. Maybe it's going to be your local ALA, which is your assisted living association, your hospital engineers, um, your risk managers, um, your maybe possibly IFMA, things that you know that you're going to have little competition to where you can go all in. Me personally, I had a massive amount of success in the Hotel and Lodging Association. I sat on the board of directors, but my first year in, I volunteered to be part of the new membership committee. Why did I do that? Well, here's the deal. I get FaceTime and I don't have to walk in as the disaster restoration guy. I walk into a hotel because other hoteliers think that when other hoteliers come into their facilities that they're scoping out the competition. So I get to be an unbiased voice. I get FaceTime in front of the COI that is non-threatening and I get to go in and invite them to the association lunches. Then I can talk business. Okay, then I get involved in the board of directors, get voted into the board. Now I want to be a keynote speaker. What are we masters of? We are masters of emergency preparedness, disaster planning, risk assessment, even educate yourself on doing things like active shooter, human trafficking awareness, things like that. So this last poll that Sean put up, how many organizations are you involved in? The majority of you said three or four. That's a good sweet spot to be in. That allows you to be all in. Okay. So when you post and pledge, not just your money, pledge your time into these organizations. How can I be more involved? How can I help you go in with that servant's heart? You will be shocked at the success and the jobs that you will get strictly because of how deep you're involved in these organizations. Some 
some people are good at being able to manage as many as seven. I think above that, I think that you're spreading yourself way too thin and you can't necessarily be effective. But, you know, go in and ask to be on the board. How can I be on membership committees? How can I become a keynote speaker so that you can increase your awareness, your frequency, and the amount of touches, and you're going to actually be able to increase the number of contacts. So the one stat that I put up there is that if you just do 10 quality contacts a day, and that's a lot if they're quality contacts, you work every day, you don't take any vacation time, no sick time, no anything, you're going to touch 2,860 people in a year. If you're in a big metroplex, you know that's less than a half a percent of the people that you need to talk to. So how do you increase that frequency? Through strategic organizational involvement. So Sean, I know you were real big on this. Do you want to add anything to that? No, I, I think, I think the, uh, like Eddie was saying, the apartment associations, hospital, engineering associations, hotel, motel association, they're great niches where it seems like in the restoration industry, everybody kind of jumps to the chambers, BOMA, IPMA, and, and those are all great if you can strategically get involved. But if you're in a group where it seems like it's mostly vendor, you need to get out. And, and the thing is, keep a low profile, you know, get in those groups and offer a lot of value. Um, you know, when we were working with the apartment association, we got emergency ready profiles on several apartments before the competition even got win what we were doing in there. So, you know, find ways to be on the board of directors. Like you said, it, it makes a big difference. Just showing up is not enough to, you got to be involved. You got to provide value. When you can do that, you will see a huge return on investment of your time and what other resources you spend in those circles as well. Yeah, and let's talk on the flip side of that. If you're involved in organizations where you do have heavy comp, you know, heavy competitive awareness in there, how do you do you differentiate yourself? You know, these guys are pledging lots of money. They're the ones up on stage. They're the ones that have their banners or getting flashed up on the screens every single luncheon. You just need to go in and out educate. Um, you need to set yourself apart by going in and having one schedule, use, utilizing those to schedule one-on-one -on -one meetings to differentiate yourself from the competition. You know, you can win, you can pick your, you can pick away at the competition. It is a little harder because, you know, they're, they're doing a great job of branding, but there are ways to win in that situation, but, and you're going to do it by out caring and out educating. Um, so the next thing that, uh, we want to talk about is documentation. So, Document, 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 document. Um, you want to make sure that you set your day up the day before, um, that you're pre-call planning for every prospect and stop that you're going to do. So let's say you're commercially centric and this is a whale hunting day. What do you know about them? Who is the COI? What is the hierarchy? Is Do they have an, a CEO of the problem that has been documented? Maybe you're going after school systems. Are you going to have a meeting with either their school board or are you going to potentially go to a district superintendent's meeting to present the ERPs? How are you being strategic? Who are you going to talk to? What do you know about them? What do you know about the company? What types of open-ended questions do you have? to where you can operate on the 30-70 rule. You talk 30% of the time, you're asking open-ended dialogue questions to where they're talking 70% of the time and closing themselves because they're giving you all the needs up front. So your CRM tool, make sure that you're, I encourage you to document it the minute you leave the facility. Do it in the parking lot. The reason being is if you try to save it for the end of the day or the end of the week, there's going to be very specific, minute details that you're going to miss. My, the way that I used to document was that if somebody came in behind me, I left that job, they would be able to pick up the pieces and they wouldn't miss a beat. They would be able to be able to read through the notes, know everything, all the intimate details about the account, um, be able to do it because let's face it, six months from now, you go back to go revisit somebody that was a cold call and you had some engaging conversation, you need ammunition. You need to know so that you're not having to go back and do a reevaluation and a rediscovery on that account. So document to where any stranger could pick up the notes and know everything about that account. Um, we talked about tracking your progress. Make sure that um, you're, you know, if you're failing um, in being able to secure that relationship, maybe you need to role play with a peer. You know, um, go out and you felt like the meeting was going to go well. Call your peer up and say, you know, hey you know, can I role play this with you and tell me what I missed? 
Um, don't be afraid to learn. Don't, you know, don't be afraid to, to operate. You know, like I said, we operate on smart, hungry, humble. Don't be afraid to employ humble, you know, and, and say, look, I, I thought that I was going to do well, but I really missed the boat on this thing. But also to keep spreadsheets uh, that, that, that detail um, your successes and your failures um, so that you know what do you need to improve on and the things that you're doing great. Second, uh, the next thing is to be relentless. Um, don't give up on the relationship. Um, because you have not won that relationship in the first year doesn't mean that you won't win it in the next year. And like I said up front, there were times that it took me as long as three or four years to win relationships. And that's okay. And I used to kind of tease them. I'd say, look, you know, um, do you, would you like to be five years younger? And they're like, sure, I'll bite. Why would I want to be five years younger? It's like, because I'm not going anywhere. You know, I have this passion that the service and value that I provide you far exceeds anybody in this industry. So I can't show them that I believe that if I'm willing to take no for an answer. So be relentless. Go back. Find other ways in because the front door of that building is locked. And, and I mean that um, I mean that hypothetically. You know, you walk in, you can't get past the gatekeeper doesn't mean that you can't climb a ladder and go in the third story window. Be creative in your approaches. Be different. If you can't get in talking about fire, water, mold, tell them how, what if I come in and do an emergency preparedness training with your staff at no charge and I'll cater in lunch? What if I come in and do active shooter? What if I come into the hotel world and teach human trafficking awareness? I did all that and nobody taught me how to do that. This was finding ways to win. It was like, if I can't get in the front door, how do I get in the third story window? I'm going to educate myself to be different and provide more value than anyone else to find unique, creative ideas to engage my audience that didn't evolve or revolve around fire, water, mold. Um, that came into the out care, out educate, out sell. It was, I cared so much. I cried with my clients. There were times that I thought way outside the box on how to be a solution to problems that had nothing to do with disaster restoration. I out-educated them. I proved this is why we are the best. Not because we're the biggest, not because we're the fastest, not because we have more equipment than anybody in town. We are better because of this, 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 and this and out-educated them, and that equaled out-selling. I know Sean is very passionate about out-care, out-educate, out-sell, so I'm gonna let him expand a little bit on that before we go to the, the final slide. Yeah, and I think, I think that's just a, a mentality of, of, you know, do you really wake up every day and truly care and are doing whatever it takes to provide more value and more education than anybody in your market? And when you have that mentality, when you walk in, instead of thinking, hmm, I wonder if I can get them to call me for fire, water, mold loss today. No, you're, you are talking about how to protect their business, whether it's a commercial facility, an insurance agent, an adjuster, a property manager. What are you doing to give them value? Because I can tell you right now, your competition is trying to sell them. And you're trying to sell something that hasn't happened yet. So when you go to buy anything in your life, when you go to buy... Um, it doesn't matter what you buy, a car, uh, a new piece of appliance for your home. What do you do? You look for research. You look at YouTube videos. You look at content that tells you why is that the best? Why is that the, the thing that's going to provide me a longevity of reliability, of, of constant quality care? That's what makes you different. That's what makes people pick up the phone and call you because you care and you have more education and value than anybody else. When you tap that in, that makes the difference and that makes them want to use you in the future and it doesn't happen overnight you've got to keep providing that value you've got to show them that you care you've got to go above and beyond what any normal salesperson will do in this industry to prove that and once you get that there and once you get there that's when you hit that spot that you care more i know a lot of you on this webinar have been in this business for a long time i see gary mayfield's on here huge heart of caring for his client. A client's not happy with him, he goes above and beyond to make sure that they get that quality care and attention that they need. It is, it is something that you have to build it into your DNA and live it, breathe it every single day. Yeah, I couldn't agree more. And I'm going to tell a couple real quick stories before we go on, because it does kind of prove that mentality. Um, you know, I, I was very blessed. Um, I'm never shy about my numbers. Um, what I did um, in a town of 460.
60,000 people in just four years. I sold over $12 million um, for, in disaster restoration. That's, you know, you don't see a lot of people that do that. And it didn't have anything to do with me being some big sales guy. It came down to the fact that I'm going to find a way to win um, with them that, that is outside the box um, that, that didn't maybe not didn't have anything do with fire water mold case in point i got called in the owner's office and he said i see on your weekly agendas every week that you do this active shooter training he goes where is the roi because i'm catering in lunch sponsoring lunches for this active shooter and i said well no i'm glad you asked i said i just spoke at the green country Healthcare alliance i said um two weeks ago and i said in the following day that big hoarder pack out that we did at gilcrease hills I said was um, a phone call from one of the people that attended that very affluent doctor and his wife had a mother that had a hoarding problem, wanted to keep it on the down low, called me out. So we ended up doing the hoarding job and the roof job ended up being $128,000. And he said, I'm never going to ask you again why you do what you do. He goes, you always quantify it. You always have ROI and your creativity gets you in doors that nobody else can get in. You know, whenever I couldn't get into the hotels with ERPs, I learned how to teach human trafficking awareness and provided value to them outside of fire, water, mold. You know, when I sat with risk managers for large grocery store chains, I asked them questions like, what keeps you up at night aside from a disaster? They said, power grid failure just kills us because we lose so much inventory. I said, so I started going around and finding resources for refrigerated trucks and what time frame I could have them there and said, okay, well, what if I have guys on standby that I can get over there to help you load your your refrigerated goods into these refrigerated trucks and a power grid failure so that you don't have spoilage and have to quote unquote eat that inventory that insurance isn't going to cover. And he thought I was the biggest godsend in the entire world because this had nothing to do with ERPs or fire water mold, but it was a solution to his problem. You know, so be creative whenever you're sitting down and looking. Don't just look at the obvious. Don't just plan for the big three. You know, you're a master of risk assessment. You see inherent risks every single day. Be able to go in there, sit, spend some time with risk managers and have them teach you high level risk assessment and go in and provide that value to your client. The last thing I really want to touch on uh, before we open this up for questions, you need to intimately know your competition. Um, if you do not know who they are, what they do, and how big of a footprint they have in your territory, you're doing yourself a disservice because it's part of the educational process. How can you differentiate yourself from the competition if you don't know them? You know, so it is very, very important to know who the key players are, what they're doing, where are they spending their money, and how are they educating their clients so that you can set yourself apart. Um, it's all part of the game. All of this sounds utterly exhausting, and it should be. It flat out should be exhausting to you to do your job to the best of your ability every single day, to be creative, to think outside the box, to attack your territory in ways that no other restoration company is, to provide value that nobody else is providing. But to intimately know your competition gives you a leg up. We've all heard the adage, keep your friends close and your enemies closer. Be colleagues and not competitors. That's how you're going to get the information that you need to know. I had a great reputation in the territory because I, I befriended a lot of our competitors. Did I like them? Oh, absolutely not. I wanted to run them off the road in a truck. You know, I didn't want them on the job. I wanted us on the job. I was that passionate about it. But the thing about it is, is that they never knew that. Um, and now, you know, as a consultant, it's helped us uh, tremendously because I can get inside information that I never would have been able to get if they viewed me as the enemy, you know, so know your competitors, know what they're about, know what they bring to the table. It helps you create your pitches to be able to malign them in a way without having to ever talk bad about them. You know, the easy ones is, is that these, I don't care how big they are. I don't care if they're a $30 million provider in your territory. If there is a community wide event, they're going to hit capacity. ServPro doesn't. ServPro doesn't hit capacity. We have unlimited resources that can come to your rescue in a community-wide event. So your comp and so your your customer is never going to be just a number to you. They're going to be taken care of. So be the brand, not the branch. Whenever you go out and pitch, be ServPro. Don't or be the big company. And if you're one of the independents that are smaller, you know you can pitch that too. 
against it. We are locally owned here. We are we are intimately involved in our communities and our territories. You know, there's ways to be able to to knock off the big box competition. But if you don't know your competitors and what they bring to the table, you have no way to know how to beat them. So, you know, like I said, I can go both sides of the road. I can pitch independent and show you how to beat the big box companies. I can pitch big box and show you how to beat the independents, you know, but you have to know how to do it. Okay. So, and if you, you only know that by intimately knowing who your competition is so that you can strategically find ways to beat them. Sean, any other insight before we go to questions and answers? No, I think, I think that, that hit it perfectly. You know, never malign your competition, but, you know, understand what you're up against and understand how you can out care out, educate better than any of them. And when you hit that on the, the nail on that head, um, it, it's complete dominance. I mean, you, you are the value added resource in your local community. People are going to call you. So I noticed we have some questions, Eddie. Um, I'm going to go ahead and read them out to you so you can go ahead and, and answer some of these live. Many agents are talking about sure. how with the effects of COVID-19, they are thinking they may stop having offices with limited hours and masks, et cetera. What changes are you seeing coming to address the COVID reality? Well, I think that's very, we are living in a very changed world. Um, you know, this, and this right here is evident, you know, with the amount of people that we see that jump on these webinars to learn tells me that you're dealing more with a captive audience. Um, you know, th because your agents may be doing away with office, it doesn't mean that you still don't have avenues to be able to market to them. You can do this right here. You know, you can set up your own webinars. You've got lots of tools um, in your chest to talk about emergency preparedness, disaster planning, risk assessment. Um, you know, what value do you bring to the table? Why should an agent choose you over, over anyone else? You know, offer to do Zoom meetings um, so that you can educate them. The good thing is, is that with them, most of them working from home, they are a captive audience and actually have a little more time time on their hands to be able to devote this rather than having people walking in every 30 seconds, taking them away, taking their attention away from you because their customers and clients are going to take precedence over you. This is a more engaging, intimate setting to where you can, you can actually identify all their concerns. You can set it up through Microsoft meetings, through Zoom, through Google Hangouts, through um, Amazon Chime, um, you know, whatever. There are all kinds of advantages to this COVID-19 thing and having a more captive audience. Um, again, I would host um, offer to, to get on and jump on a Zoom webinar with them so that you can identify, you know, what do you like about the people that you refer to? Why would you refer to them? And then you take, you know, detailed notes and you're able to be able to overcome those objections. You know, the easiest way to overcome that objection is if you could change something um, about what they do and the services they provide, what would it be? And now you've planted a seed of dissension with who they're currently referring work to, and you're able to expand on that. You know, it's, it's your job to come up with creative and engaging questions. But right now with COVID-19, I think more and more, you have better opportunity to engage on a more intimate level with clients and prospective clients than you ever have before. We led a, a webinar not very long ago about how to market digitally. If you don't have that link, shoot us an email right there is our emails on the screen. We'll send you a replay of that webinar um, to where you can be more effective in the digital space um, to be able to engage uh, either through LinkedIn, through social media platforms, and be able to use digital marketing, um, digital platforms to be able to close business. So hope that answers your question. If not, shoot me an email and I'll deal with it one-on-one -on -one, um, as well if that was too vague. Yeah, so I went ahead and put a, a, a follow-up. If any of you guys are looking for more insight on your local marketing strategies with me and Eddie, we'd be more than happy to schedule one. <laughs> Please don't say no. I don't like these guys at all. So, uh, <laughs> you can say yes. If, if you don't want to, just you don't have to put anything. But, um, yeah, I mean, if you don't like Eddie, that's fine, too. You can put uh, – Yeah, um, that's probably more more often than not. <laughs> well, but, hey, um, Eddie, we got a couple – if you guys have questions, go ahead and put them in the chat box or the Q&A box. Uh, Doug was just talking about, he wanted to share, thank you, Sean and Eddie, uh, great webinar. Uh, we had good success hosting virtual CE classes for insurance agents, have a second plan in June. So, Doug, I think that's awesome that you guys- Way to go, Doug. You've taken this, this tough, crazy time, and you just found a way around it. And 
that's what you need to continue to do. But don't be afraid to take these webinar formats on Zoom and sign up for free. Play with Zoom. It's not that expensive if you need a bigger platform to host more people, but the free version will give you enough to get started. But, you know, tell people, hey, you know, here's three things you can do to prevent a water loss in your facility or three things to do provide, you know, your insured clients on how to be better prepared for a rainy season, whatever, you know, provide. Well, and if you and and if you want some help on, on, you know, catchy little platforms to be able to engage your audience, I mean, email Sean and I, whether you're clients of ours or not, you know, we're, we're here to help. We believe in one restoration nation. Um, you know, would we love to do your digital marketing? I think we're the best at it there is um, because we've worked intimately in this industry uh, at a very high level. So we're not throwing darts at a map, you know, shameless plug for tier level. But even if you're not our client, you can still engage us. We're not going to try to beat you over the head and sell you. We're, we believe in One Restoration Nation. We're here to help restoration providers be the best they can be. Awesome. Amber, Amber uh, said that they, uh, they did this a couple weeks ago and have already started one in June. Great. I know we talked about that a little bit. Um, uh, a lot of you are, are definitely getting more involved in these digital, uh, that, those of you that were on the Zoom webinar. And, and again, if we, we've been so busy the last few weeks. Um, if we have not gotten back to you, please follow up with us. Amber, I know you might have some follow-up questions. Feel free. Um, you or Angela are more than welcome to reach back out to us. If you have any glitches or anything like that, you want to fine tune, feel free to reach out to myself or Eddie. And I think some of you talked to Whitney on our team as well. Um, we're, we are always available. It's just been crazy, crazy busy lately. But, um, any other questions on territorial planning that you guys have? Any struggles that you guys are having? I know uh, Tracy uh, put up there. Uh, she was talking about, I'm currently on the board for facilities managers, local chapter, and flooded with many competitors who are expanding, et cetera. I'm on the board, but very frustrating. So Eddie, how, how would you give her some advice on, you know, if, if it is crowded with competitors, how do you kind of cut through that, that wave of, of co competition to make yourself stand out? Absolutely. So, you know, one thing about it is every, if you're on the board, everybody's going to be gunning for you. Um, you know, it's, it's unfortunately, you know, one of the drawbacks to big box franchise companies is that the bulk of the marketing falls upon the, upon the franchise and it's not provided by um, the big locals to where companies like Belfour have this massive marketing budget and will pull the trigger without even blinking on, you know, massive sponsorships. So they're always running and gunning for you. You know, again, I think it all boils down to just providing more value. Um, you know, how deep are the relationships that you have with the board? Are they willing to do warm introductions to some of the ancillary members um, that may be there? Some of the smaller members that may not have board affiliation, you know, ask them. You, one of the biggest ways to differentiate yourself, though, is to be a keynote speaker at the luncheons. Um, ask them if you can teach over emergency preparedness, risk assessment, um, you know, disaster prep, uh, what happens in a community-wide event, um, you know, or even over priority responding. Um, that's a big one because it allows you to discuss the power of relationship uh, versus having to wait for everybody to show up uh, with a work authorization in their hand, all preaching the same thing. We're the biggest, we're the best, we're the fastest sign here. We'll get started right now. Um, it has to do with relationship and value and education. So just continue to dig. There's always going to be competition. They're not going anywhere. Um, and the better you are, the harder it is going to be for you to retain those relationships because they're watching you too. You know, they're, they're watching what you're doing to be successful and they're taking those best practices and adapting them and making them even better for them. You know, so just stay ahead of the game, be a true student of the game, stay ahead of the curve, um, provide more value, more education and out care. And I promise in the end, you will win. Hey, uh, George Shackwick from uh, Chicago land area. He said, we have a lot of big players, green teams, et cetera, as well as extremely large independents. So I, obviously, Eddie, he's in Chicago. Yes, you do. <laughs> we also have very aggressive independent challenging times. What would you recommend to George? He's a, I believe he's a surfer owner. Um, what would you recommend him in terms of, I, I mean, I think it's really where the out there out educate comes in to cut through that clutter, but how, what would you tell them to start really targeting maybe to get some wind under those bigger players like you did here in Tulsa um, when we were competing against big independents and, and other companies as well? Well, I'm going to throw you, I'm going to throw you a big bone here, um, George, and thanks for the question. I'm, I'm friends with Jennifer 
Um, she is the head of the Illinois um, Hotel and Lodging Association who said that there was lots of financial affiliation with the Hotel and Lodging Association, but very little time commitment. Um, that's where you really will differentiate yourself is, is going in and providing value through your time with the organizational involvement. She was begging um, for people to jump in and have the same type of affiliation that I had with the Metro Tulsa Hotel and Lodging Association, which I was all in. I was at every event. Um, I was an ambassador for them. I was on the new membership um, affiliation recruitment committee, um, you know, was a sponsor, was a unbiased voice on the board of, on the board of directors for new ideas, worked in conjunction with Visit Tulsa, um, you know, things like that. They're looking for that kind of involvement. And and, you know, as a serve pro owner, you have a tool in your shed that a lot of restoration providers don't have, which is the emergency preparedness tool. Um, and you can provide that at no cost um, for all the hotels, which can help them minimize the loss. Um, so ask to, to be a keynote speaker at a luncheon um, to show the value of emergency preparedness, how many hundreds of thousands, if not millions of dollars it has saved uh, companies by having these plans in place. Um, but again, it is just sitting down with the heads of these organizations, winning their trust so that they feel good to be able to warm hand off you there. Um, but I do agree with you. You do have, you do have some very intense competition in the Chicago land area. Um, and it is going to take creativity. Um, you know, like having your sales reps learn how to teach active shooter and going into like assisted living associations and leading in services for the directors. Um, you know, how do you differentiate yourself from the competition? The one challenge that our gauntlet that I used to lay down to all eight of my business development people was you have this week. I want you to go tell me your success stories of how you sold, how you sold our restoration company without ever talking about fire, water, mold. And they were like, well, how are we supposed to do that? And I'm like, I, that's why I hired you. I hired you to be creative. Um, so I want to know your wins and losses at the end of the week. And that was the way we did it was by going in and teaching like risk assessment. You're standing in an assisted living facility and you're looking, everybody plans for the big three or the big four, which are fire, water, storm. And, uh, you know, when in the assisted living world, they plan for the big four, which includes power grid failure, you know, how can I provide supplemental power to these people in a power grid failure? How can I help them with transportation to get to an alternate facility if that facility is compromised? How can I provide um, additional food storage options for them? Do I have relationships so that I can provide them with porta potties and hand wash stations in the event that they lose water? You know, how those are the types of resources that I thought about, but also too, they may have a train track running behind their facility and have no risk plan, mitigation plan for a train derailment. What can I do to help them and to help mitigate that? What do I help them mitigate in the event that the car runs through their front door? Can I set up a color coded system for active shooters so that I don't, don't alarm dementia patients in a dementia care facility? You know, it was, these were the ways that I thought, and this is the way I challenged my team to think is why, why would they call me for everything? not just fire, water, mold. How am I their one resource for everything that could potentially happen? So when you get there, you beat your competition. Great insight, Eddie. Well, um, we are we're about out of time right now. So what I wanna do is if you guys have any other questions, feel free to email us. Our emails are on the screen. Um, we will be available. We've already got a few emails I saw pop up. Um, so we'd be more than happy. We'll get back to you um, today as well. So. Um, thank you guys so much. Tomorrow we have a really good webinar. If you haven't registered yet, tierlevel.com forward slash webinar. Um, it'll be on myths of soft content cleaning. And then uh, Eddie's going to be doing another webinar next week on the art of the cold call. But tomorrow's going to be a great one. We're going to be talking about Bigfoot, UFOs, and uh, several myths of soft Lock content. Nest monster. <laughs> It's going to be exciting. So I um, appreciate you guys. Thank you so much for uh, uh, coming on today. And we'll, we'll talk to you guys a little bit later. Thanks, guys.